This is the Telegraph Cycling Podcast, supported by Jaguar. Today, we're in Le Havre. Hello, my name is Richard Moore. I'm with Daniel Freib. Hello. Lionel Burney. Hello. And drumroll, Ciro Scognomilio. Hello, everyone, listeners. Can we, can Ciro. We, can we pause for the Italian national anthem? Yeah, let's all pause for the Italian national anthem, play that in our heads. Ciro joins us as a result of um, industrial action, I believe, a strike at Gazzetta della Sport. Uh, yes, we talked with Vincenzo Nibali immediately after the stage, after this crash, and mainly uh, we saw Chris Froome exiting out of the bus of Astana. And uh, we said, what's happening here? You, Maybe the world no, has no. changed. What's no happening shopper. here? What's happening here? No shopper. Sorry, my, my <laughs> listeners, I'm really so shocked from this strike. We've come yeah. several steps ahead there, Chiro. Yeah, yeah, you know, Richard, my head is not shocked. always... Shocked. Yes, I'm shocked. shocked. That, that made last night's live podcast look not look slick and professional. <laughs> yeah, not yet. But, uh, I mean, uh, nevertheless, this strike, I'm here with you, so any shocked. problems. Shocked wasn't the adjective he used about half an hour ago. He was delighted. <laughs> anyway, we're, we've jumped several steps ahead. There's lots to talk about in today's stage as ever. Lots of action. Chiro's nodding knowingly. But first, Lionel, give us a little, you know, you tell us what's actually going on. In bullet point, stage six, Toulave, in, uh, on the northern coast of France. A three-man breakaway basically took up most of the stage. Uh, Kenneth Van Bilsen of Cofidis, Perry Kemener of Europe Car, and Daniel tekla Hymenot of MTN Quebec. They were caught quite close to the finish. Tekla Hymenot had done enough to become the first, uh, well, the first Eritrea, and obviously to wear the polka dot jersey as King of the Mountains. But the big talking point of the day is the crash. That looks like it's taken uh, Tony Martin, the yellow jersey, out of the Tour de France. Um, it's confirmed this evening that he has a collarbone break. Not sure whether it's a fracture or displaced um, break, but it's looking unlikely that his participation in the Tour de France will be going on for too much longer. Can't rule out him starting on Friday morning, of course, at this stage, but it's unlikely that he will get too much further into the race. Uh, the stage was won by Martin's Etix Quickstep teammate, ZNX Dibar. Uh, and the big news that Chiro mentioned there already is that Chris Froome and Vincenzo Nibali had a little tea party on the Astana bus. I think that's how... The day ended. Chris Baldwin, the Astana team press officer, uh, suggested that Chris Froom was looking for Thai restaurant recommendations in Le Havre, <laughs> and that that's why he went aboard the Astana bus. I'm not, qu- I'm not sure about that. It was very strange. I was walking back after the finish towards the the team buses, and I passed Sky, and there was a bit of panic around the Sky bus, and. Dave Brailsford was talking to Rod Ellingworth. Rod Ellingworth then disappeared. Several minutes later, I saw Chris Froome and Luke Rowe uh, riding back towards the Sky Bus. And I thought they'd just not seen it and ridden straight past it. But then, of course, it transpired that they, well, Froome had marched, had ridden up to the Astana bus, seven buses further along, got on board, and uh, had words with Vincenzo Nibali. Now, Chiro, if anybody knows what was said between the two it'll be you what do you know y- yes i know maybe the only one in our planet uh, i know this uh, <laughs> the problem is that uh, vincenzo nibali in a very sp- what about other planets uh, i mean uh, i i know also other planets for sure but uh, the problem was that Vincenzo Nibali was really upset with Chris Froome immediately after the crash because he was convinced that it was a Chris Froome fault about his crash. But as a matter of fact, and I think that there was, uh, there has been a really quarrel between them. But uh, after this explanation, Nibali understood well that wasn't from fault and so they clarify everything is okay with them and that at the end Nibali say also yes for sure that uh, uh, it's clear everything is clear between us because we are cyclists and not footballers so whose fault was it the crash 
Daniel and I were watching Tony, it over, over and yeah. over. Uh, it I seemed mean, like Tony Martin just caught the Europe car. Was it Brian Cockard, friend of the pro- podcast, Brian Cockard? Yeah, from the overhead shot, it looked pretty bad, didn't it? It looked pretty incriminating. When you first saw it, it looked as though Tony Martin had just swung across and committed a professional foul. Lionel did a very amusing sort of impersonation of a hypothetical football manager talking about the foul that Martin committed. Go on, Lionel. <laughs> Uh, what did I say? I, it's, it's escaped he's me away. Kind of player, oh, he's, not, he's not that kind of boy, you know. The boy, he, that's not in his nature. That he's gone for the ball. Yeah, he's he's he's, gone he's tried to play the ball. He's tried to play the ball, and he's just gone through uh, neck high. <laughs> he's just gone straight through and broken his legs. No, but he, I, I think. Hang on, I, I think you're being very harsh on Tony Martin there. He, I think that that I mean, Cockard sort of cut him up no. a bit. I think what happened was that he clipped Cockar's wheel and couldn't prevent himself from falling. But at first, it looked as though he was exacting some kind of retribution on the giant Alpecin rider, which, who I think was Warren Bargui, who was coming up his right-hand side. However, I think Tony Martin was innocent. It was Warren Bargui, was it? Yeah. Um, inter- no, I mean, but you know, anyone who's ridden a bike and you touch a wheel like that, you lose balance. And you can see Martin trying to compensate for... The bike going one way, his body going the other way, and you know, Chiro. Have you no, that? yes, no. I was thinking still to the summary that uh, Lionel uh, do for us uh, the summary of the stage of the day. Richard, I must confess uh, the best summary of the tour that I ever heard. So I mean, the <laughs> listeners, they are really lucky because the summary was perfect eh, of Lionel. I was thinking about that. You can, are you just going to steal it for your web report for the for Gazetta? Uh, yeah, my, mm, yes, yes, why not? But but not until tomorrow, because you're on strike today, right? Yes, exactly, but it's a strange strike, as uh, in Italy, you know, some things, something uh, is strange. For example, it's a strike for the newspaper, but not for, for the website. So, and a half strike, something... So there's made. no newspaper, no Gazetta tomorrow? No Gazetta tomorrow, yes. Wow. Exactly. wow. Uh, just on the crash, yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a little moment where Brian Cockard seemed to sort of you know, miss half a pedal rev as he's trying to avoid the wheel in front. And then I wondered whether, it's pure speculation, but whether not just a clip of wheels, but if Tony Martin had his front wheel, the wrong side of Cockar's back wheel. But it's the sort of shoulder barge move that if you watch it over and over on YouTube, as I have, it's that move that Tony Martin makes that is really unexplained. I mean, yeah, I don't think it's something unexplained. Well, to fall is one thing, but to kind of throw his upper body weight that but he's way. He's throwing his body that way to balance the bike because he's he's caught the wheel, the bike is being is off balance and he's moving his body weight to try and regain balance. Oh yeah, I'm not trying to apportion blame to him and we'll give it sounds, it sounds like you are. <laughs> well okay, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. But it was a Are you suggesting that Tony Martin fell deliberately? That that was even on his on his mind? No, I don't know what was on his mind. I, I mean, you know, he didn't come into the press conference afterwards. Uh, he's in he hospital. Got, he's gone to hospital to, <laughs> to find out that his collarbone is, is broken. It's, it's a bad one, isn't it? It's, it's a bad one. My flabber is gasted. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we, have all, we can also say that Tony Marty is the second year, is the second rider in this Tour de France to crash with the yellow jersey. Fabian Cancellara also did some days ago. Maybe first time in the history that in the first six stages, two yellow jersey, two crashes. And and will that mean that Froome, we've not actually got the official results yet, but is Froome back in yellow? I guess so. Well, the question is whether he would actually wear the yellow jersey in the event of Tony Martin not starting on Friday morning. I mean, precedence, precedence. Well, this, this, you know, Froome going on to the Starna bus for what was originally intended to be a dust-up and coming off. and the, well, amid Some recommendations these, for yeah, Tyrese. all these pleasantries. I mean, the, the fair play in cycling now gets kind of nauseous, doesn't it? You wow. know, if he doesn't wear the yellow jersey tomorrow, we would have much preferred. In Bernardino's day, there would have been a dust-up on the time, on the... In the middle of the road, wouldn't they? It would, but uh, of course, Daniel, you're the authority on Eddie Merckx. And then uh, 1971, oh, 1971, oh. Luis Ocaña crashed out while wearing a yellow jersey. Merckx didn't wear the yellow jersey the next day, did he? At the request of Jacques Godet, the tour director at the time, Eddie Merckx himself was not particularly enamoured with it, with that gesture that he got a lot of praise for. Well, Greg LeMond did the same in uh, 91, I think. Rolf Sorensen, a Danish rider, crashed out at the finish and um, was unable to start the next day, even though he was officially the yellow jersey, so Greg LeMond didn't wear it. But there have been times when a rider has pulled out of the race 
um, in the yellow jersey and the uh, the following day whoever's kind of inherited it has started in it I think the the distinction is that you know it's a kind of a crash rather than sort of pulling out I think was it Stefan Erlo in the 90s who had a terrible day and he's, he's basically I think had terrible knee pain and, and had to pull out of the race uh, when he was wearing the yellow jersey but I don't think the same kind of etiquette was observed in Pascal Simon in 1983 uh, well, Fignon took that jersey, didn't he, and, and wore it. Uh, Simon had been injured for a number of days after a crash. He had a broken collarbone mm. and, and sold it. Rolf Sorensen, I believe. Yeah, well, it's a common cycling injury, isn't it? But, um, yeah, Pascal Simon in 83, you know, the race went into a kind of sort of stasis, didn't it? Mm. It sort of um, nothing really happened. No one wanted to be seen to attack the yellow jersey. So it'll be interesting to see what does happen, whether Tony Martin starts on Friday and if, if he does... I mean, course, it's looking unlikely. It's fine if it's Chris Froome saying I'm not going to wear the yellow jersey as a mm. gesture. If it, imagine if it was a, a, a lesser rider, might be his only chance mm. ever to wear the yellow jersey. Yeah. Day before the team time trial, he's not going to pass up the opportunity, is he? No, that's a very good point. Yeah, Chris Froome's already worn yellow in this race. He may well wear it again. Well, he will wear it again. You would imagine, or maybe he won't. I mean, who knows? This is you know we're getting no, back into specu- spec- you don't like no. speculation. <laughs> No really. speculation line. But just facts for, only. Just for the uh, just for the record, I'm not, I wasn't blaming Tony Martin for the crash. I'm just saying it didn't it didn't look unexplained. It didn't look unexplained. <laughs> um, try try to work try to sift through the negatives there. No, maybe the best Lionel ever today. <laughs> maybe Lionel at the uh, top of his game. He's Steve. Are we, are we even going to talk about Steve Bar? I mean, Steve Barr, the, the stage winner, w- would there ever be a day? The big stories are Daniel Teklaheim and not. We're going to get on to him soon. And obviously, Tony Martin. Uh, not not a great day to win a stage, was it? No. Um, and did Etix Quickstep, was it? Was there a ruse? Was there a bluff? Um, they suggested, certainly, when interviewed on live French television, Patrick Lefebvre talk about, talked about Mikhail Kwiatkowski being the leader today or being their best chance of victory he certainly wasn't in the shake-up was he we didn't really expect him to be in the shake-up because we've spoken previously in the last few days about Kwiatkowski's form not being terribly good Cavendish was poised at one point on Mark Renshaw's wheel it looked as though they were going to do the unthinkable and and keep the group together and lead it out for a sprint and Cavendish was going to win that didn't happen and maybe maybe Cavendish was there as a decoy for Steve a decoy for Steve Bob, but he certainly yeah. we didn't really see the race winning move did we did anybody see the race winning move the, the, the cameras lingered on the crash and we by were, the time we, we too busy watching Tony Martin's professional fa- I mean we, sorry we, it's, we, it's, it's we, accidental I mean, did Tony Martin think that he was taking out John Degenkolb when he saw a giant Alperson <laughs> rider uh, uh, Richard you should know that my main interest is not the race I mean this <laughs> question seems to be we're near I the sea know, here Chiro. I don't think there are any nice beaches nearby but. yes I mean it's not really my typical sea but why not better than nothing and now Le Pédaleur de Charme, supported by British Eurosport. Okay, so today's um, hotly contested Pédaleur de Charme, presented by British Eurosport. We had a few nominations, Damiano Caruso, um, the, the Irishman. <laughs> Damien O. Caruso, yes. Uh, I'm not sure that's a terribly PC sort of joke to, to say yeah, on the air. Yeah, I, mean, just, I, mean, yeah, I, mean, I mean, no harm. I have Irish heritage, so... Um, all right, all right, right, Lionel, I think you've, right. you've offended enough people for one day. I mean, Tony Martin speaking to his lawyers as we speak. <laughs> D- Damiano Caruso landed on a bale of hay. Chiro's making a phone call, maybe phoning Caruso, his countryman, I don't know. He's nodding vigorously, but then he often nods vigorously. Other nominations, Daniel Tekelheimanot was an obvious one, but he won the the the, the inaugural Peddler de Charme just for starting first on Saturday. That was maybe a mistake. We should have kept we should have held that back. We're frantically thumbing through the rule book, the hefty rule book for the Peddler de Charme. I mean it's it's not really nailed down, is it? Um, can you win it twice? It's a movable feast. But, of course, in the Tour de France, you have a hierarchy of, of jerseys where yellow, green, polka yeah. dot, white... You know, if, you, if you're in white and yellow, you obviously wear yellow. If you're in green and, and polka dot, you wear green. If you are in polka dots and Pedler de Charme, you wear Pedler de Charme. And we feel it would be disrespectful to the tour organisers to... <laughs> well, given that Chris Froome may not, probably won't wear the yellow jersey tomorrow, maybe this is the opportune moment to give him the Pedler de Charme jersey. Maybe he'll wear it in tomorrow's stage. 
That's not a bad shout, but Lionel's screwing up his face. Well, Do you want to offend Chris Froome as well? I mean, uh, it was a very charming behaviour, was it? I think Nibali, well, Nibali sort of maybe deserves it more for char- Anyway, we have decided on a, on a winner, and it's slightly left field. It's Ivan Basso, the blueberry farmer. <laughs> Ivan Basso. Tell us why, Daniel. Well, there I was this morning, and where do we start? Uh, Abbeville. Abbeville. Yeah. Minding my own business, I'd done my work for the morning, I was just... Uh, leaning um, on the on a Saxon Bank team car, just watching the world go by. 15 minutes to the start. I'm quite happy not to do any more interviews this morning. And, and Ivan Basso, there he was, 10 yards away, fighting his way through a crowd to get to me. And I was quite happy just giving him a smile and a wave. Um, but no, he insisted on being interviewed. He wanted to have a word with me. So over he came, parked himself in front of me and proceeded to hold forth about his prospects for the Tour de France, how his team was feeling, the latest blueberry harvest and um, yeah, he was there about five minutes and I was I was trying to shake him off to be honest <laughs> Well, you're going to not be able to shake him off because tomorrow, you've, you're still, you still have to get the jersey, go. the, 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 the t-shirt actually... to Matteo Trentin but <laughs> you, tomorrow, Daniel priority number one is to get the t-shirt to Ivan Basso. I'm, I'm actually due to meet someone at Basso's hotel at the Tinkoff Saxo Hotel in about 15 minutes, so maybe I could do it this evening. Can you do it this evening, perfect. And I have a revelation tonight. I'm in the same hotel of Ivan Basso, our peddler of the charm of today. Uh, so peddler of the charm. Peddler of the charm. And for me, Ivan Basso is more than a rider. I have to say that. For me, just to explain to our listeners, it's a kind of lighthouse. <laughs> You can't say that. What do you sure, mean? Kind of because it is, it, it's an Italian word. You, say, you call someone un faro. Exactly. It's, exactly. A light, it's literally a lighthouse. <laughs> it means that it's a symbol. It's a talisman. A talisman. It's a talisman. Yeah. It's a, I mean, <laughs> we need that. We need just one podcast. Uh, World podcast to explain, but the talisman is the correct word. Perfect. This could be a T-shirt, the lighthouse. Anyway, the uh, lighthouse light- fam. we're off to the lighthouse family's hotel in just a minute. <laughs> well, it should be easy to find. Um, let's 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 crack on to this stage, shall we? Because let's talk about Daniel Teckleheim and all. I as as lucky. This is very unusual for for us to be so prescient. Um, because we're generally we're, we're a bit of a curse we were with our mm. podcast you know with our we did a, a classic special for friends of the podcast sign up as a friend of the podcast the cycling podcast.com five pounds we'll gain you access to our friend specials a few of those coming up but we did one in the spring on Fabian Cancellara and Tom Boone and only for both of them to then crash and uh, miss the big classics but anyway we did this morning one of our kilometer zero programs which is our our morning podcast on the Eritreans um, and lo and behold there is one of them Daniel Teckleheim and all, in the break today and the, the mission was to get enough points to win King of the Mountains jersey um, which he did at the Criterium du Dauphiné before the tour he likes polka dots that was the mission today and uh, really uh, a fantastic day for MTN Quebec in their first Tour de France yeah absolutely and a great story for the tour as well really it, I was talking a couple of days ago when Tony Martin took the yellow jersey that it was a great sort of unravelling that could be Tony Martin there yeah it could be unless yeah yeah um, I was talking a couple of days ago about how uh, Tony Martin getting the yellow jersey after so many near misses was a great sort of unravelling narrative for the tour uh, you know, which which thrives on good sort of storytelling and things that capture the imagination. I think Tekla not taking the polka dot jersey is an, is another example of that. So as you were saying, Lionel, um, Tekla Heimannot, you finished? Oh, sorry, finished. sorry, let's just cut out that bit. Daniel. Yes. Daniel Tekla Heimannot. I think you, yes. you interviewed him a few years ago. Yes, I interviewed him in 2009 when he was riding at the Tour de l'Avenir. He was at the UCI World Cycling Centre at the time. Um, I remember speaking to his coach, Michel Tez, who is someone who knows Chris Froome very well because he was Chris Froome's coach as well when he spent some time at the World Cycling Centre. Um, Tech Lahaimanot at the time was... Um, he was doing pretty well there at the UCI, but he, he also had quite a few health problems. He had a congenital heart defect, which was actually pretty serious at the time. And um, 
Michel Tez was very keen for him to get an operation and to get it sorted out because it was something that could have threatened his future as a professional cyclist. And um, that is resolved now, I think. He also, I think he's also got one leg significantly longer than the other. Um, there have been a few very good professional cyclists who have had that issue, haven't there? Luke LeBlanc was one, Frank Vandenbroek is another. Um, but Taylor Hymenot has, we turned pro with Orica Green Edge, didn't he? He didn't achieve particularly noteworthy results, individual results for them, but was a solid domestique. And, um, and he seems to have, so he seems to be carving out this niche for himself um, as, a, as a, a rider who targets mountains prizes he did it at the Dauphiné he's done it here he's not someone I expect to what, keep the jersey through the high mountains but I'm sure well over the next week or so he, he could keep hold of that I mean it's it's very difficult for the Eritreans to go home see their families and come back to Europe on multiple occasions during the season because they often have v- big visa problems and this is a problem that Tekla Hymenot has had. He's been marooned back home for long periods of the season before and um, it's kept him out of action but um, yeah very very happy for him and I'm sure this will get a lot of coverage back home. Yeah I remember I spoke to Douglas Ryder the team principal earlier in the season and you know he, he talked about one of the problems facing the African riders when they come to Europe are the roads and, and they have problems riding in the, in, in the bunch partly because they're used to riding on roads that go in a straight line. This is a huge generalisation but a lot of the riders he's had used to riding in, in vast sort of landscapes, roads that go in a straight line for, for miles on end. They come to Europe and the roads are twisting, turning, going through towns and villages. And that adds so many technical challenges to racing. And that's one of the problems they have. Anyway, at the finish, I spoke briefly to Tala Farrar, the American rider who joined this year from, from Garmin and is a sort of, a sort of captain. I also spoke to Jens Zemka, the director sportif, um, and you will hear now from Tyler Farrar and then Jens Zemka. Fantastic day for your team today, Daniel Teklaheimenot in the polka dot jersey. Justified your invitation. Yeah, it's huge. You know, um, we came, like I said, we said from the beginning, we came here to really take part in the race. You know, we've been getting up in the mix on the sprint stages, and now uh, with Daniel in the polka dot jersey it's huge yeah it's a how, big deal how do you enjoy your role with the team it's obviously different to your previous role at Garmin you take on a sort of more of a, a captain's role here how do you enjoy sort of uh, sharing some of your experience with the younger riders oh I'm having a really good time you know I think uh this is a great team it's uh it's got a great attitude and uh, a great kind of ethos and I really love being a part of it and like I say, we've been having fun at the tour here, and uh, I think it's off to a decent start for sure. And like I said, having Daniel take the jersey today is a really big deal for us. Yeah, very proud day for the, the team. Yeah, I mean, that was our plan since long time ago. And um, yeah, Daniel rode super well in the Dauphiné two weeks ago where he won the mountain jersey. And I think he, he liked it. <laughs> So we made a plan that we uh, that we said we have to, if we get it, then we have to do it early. So we tried already on the second stage. And today again, so the sprints that I saw from Daniel were superb. And we are the first, so that was first the one, African that, team and wear a jersey, so a dream comes true. That was the, mi- that was the one mission today, was it? Get the polka dot jersey. Yeah, that was a mission today. And we had the other goal to bring um, Edwald in good position for the stage win. Unfortunately, this, this crash happened, and then yeah, congrats to to Steba, But uh, we hoped also here for a for an absolute top result with Eddie. How is uh, Edval going? Yeah, super. I mean, the last two stages, fifth place, today seventh. If you are so close to the victory, that sees that shows that the shape is there, and that he is able to win. There's another stage a couple of stages that suit him particularly Saturday perhaps is that one that you're identifying as a target yeah from my perspective he is one of the fastest boys uh, if the stage is pretty tough so we want to create this situation and we are planning this since yeah since a couple of months he came back um, pretty impressive after the broken collarbone in Genwerfegem so he really could focus for the Tour de France and yeah we still have a couple of other options will there be a little celebration tonight first jersey yes i think the celebration uh, started already i want to see the team owner douglas Ryder. i think he will have will tears you be in buying the eyes. champagne tonight 
Uh, no, we prefer the South African wine. <laughs> Follow us on Twitter at cycling underscore podcast or on our website, thecyclingpodcast.com. Okay, before we wrap up for tonight, I'm just, we're still joined by uh, Chiro Scognamilo here. Just one little point I want to say, because we, were, we did our live show last night. Thank you, everyone, who, who listened to that. We'll do that again next Wednesday. And some of you asked questions. I, th- thinking about it later, there was one question that was quite an interesting question that I don't think we answered very satisfactorily. <laughs> And it was a question about domestiques, and we were asked, what domestique would you most like to see unshackled and left to his own devices? And there were a lot of suggestions for Geraint Thomas for that. That's always something that you hear. But, you know, I think if Geraint Thomas was wanting and had the desire and the temperament to be a leader, he would have become a leader a couple of years ago. There's more to being a leader than just having the physical ability, which he clearly has. And this, for me was brought into sharp focus a few days ago in, I can't remember where it was, but the day that John Degenkolb was second, the day that Tony Martin won, um, Cambrai, uh, when Degenkolb was furious at not winning. And riders who win a lot of races tend to be absolutely furious when they don't win. And it's hard to imagine Geraint Thomas feeling that sort of fury at not winning. Now, that that's maybe unfair, but this desire to win is something that a leader a winner needs to have and not every rider has it anyone got anything to add to that or are we just going to draw a line at that I, I think you've expressed that very eloquently <laughs> Chiro is shaking his head oh I was not really concentrated Richard <laughs> I must confess about you no I was thinking to another topic what were you thinking about uh, lighthouses about no no lighthouses also no but not in this case I'm thinking about uh, a friend a really close friend of mine an Italian journalist uh, Alessandra Gozzini she's really nice looking she's <laughs> really a marvelous journalist and she wants to become uh, a friend of our podcast for that I was thinking about this so. okay that's nice well tell her she's very welcome to become a friend of the podcast thanks for that any other any other business chaps any, anyone else got any unresolved issues from now Chiro walks off this is what he does he walks off he's waving bye Chiro Anyone else got any unresolved issues? Any anything that they want to clear up after last night's live podcast? Mm, no, yeah, I can't remember. Oh, we we nominated Pozzato, didn't we? I think Fuglesang is a, a domestic that most people. I think he'd like to see himself unshackled, wouldn't he? He would. Um, I think the question there is: is does he have the ability? Yeah, he's he's kind of been inconsistent, hasn't he? When he has had those glimmers of opportunity in the past, he's he's tended to be one of those guys who who has a bad day here or there. Um, but it'd be interesting to see how he fares this tour. There's a feeling that he's fitter than ever, better equipped than ever to certainly accompany. It's it's in interesting. The mountains. I mean, Richie Port is somebody who's clearly wanted to, to lead a team, but again, there's. Uh, he he's somebody who needs a lot of support and again maybe that's not something that's compatible with being a, a really effective leader um fulo sang is a rider who i remember there are riders and charlie wigalius expressed this very well in your kilometer zero he did express this very eloquently about the that a rider needs to be pragmatic you know and someone like linus gerdeman who you've written about a lot daniel is somebody who strikes me as somebody who always saw himself as a team leader and instead of accepting a sort of lesser role, he, he's drifted down the teams, remaining a leader, but, you know, sort of sinking down the divisions. I think we and other people often levelled that criticism at Nicholas Roach, didn't we? We did, until he joined, I think, um, Tinkoff Saxo and reconciled himself to the to a, to a different role, which is was not leading a team, but being a sort of super domestic. Yeah, I think that um, in terms of the, grand, uh, the Tour de France and the other Grand Tours, there's always this temptation, somebody finishes 12th or 9th or 7th in, in one of the Grand Tours, there's always this expectation that they're going to kick on, and often that isn't the case. Um, often that is as good as they're going to get. And it doesn't necessarily follow that, you know, if you finish 4th in Nerve Welter, you're, you're capable of finishing, you know, a similar position in the Tour de France. They are actually very different races, suit different characteristics, and the the... the the microscope on this race is so intense and you feel it now in uh, almost a week in the sort of the energy it requires just to be in the Tour de France bubble um, day by day you know it's so vast it's so massive and Daniel you're talking about the crowds this morning the crowds at the start for the riders you know the, the stress levels are getting ramped up mm. from the minute they leave their hotels 
um, to the minute they get back to their hotels. And, and we saw it the other night, didn't we, Richard, at the hotel where the Cannondale Garmin team was sitting down for dinner at 10 to 10. And that sort of surprised me a little bit because it feels very late in the day to be kind of loading up on food for the next day and then going to bed late. To put that in perspective, Buffalo Grill's now closed at 10. At 10. Well, you, <laughs> that's something to, you know only to, too well. They used they? to stay up until 11, but... Did you manage to get a proper take, proper um, dinner last McDonald's, night? McDonald's, we spoke about that, didn't we? I Did thought we I thought you were McDonald's the previous night. Oh, last, last night. Week. No, no, no. Very good last night in Amiens. Actually, where we ate for your wedding. Um, you know, you know, Rich, you got married in Amiens, very close. And mm-hmm. um, one of the restaurants we, that we ate on that weekend. Um, anyway, just go back quickly. Garant Thomas, I know, Lionel, you don't like speculation. Um, but there is a lot of speculation about people like Garant Thomas, how good they'd be as leaders. I think the thing you always have to remember in these cases is the person who is best equipped to... Um, judge someone's capacity or potential as a grand tour rider or a leader or whatever are the people selecting the team and are the you know direct sportives in Garrett Thomas's case Dave Brailsford if Dave Brailsford thought that Garrett Thomas was a better option than than Chris Froome Richie Poor or whoever else he would be in that position as a, as the, a leader and the, he's not by the way please 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 do not interpret what I said earlier as any kind of criticism of Garrett Thomas because on the contrary We've I, done I, that before, haven't we? No, no, but on the contrary, I, I would argue that Garen Thomas is almost too well adjusted to be a, a winner. Mm. He's a he's a very level headed, very grounded guy and, and a lot of the guys who are winning bike races aren't. I mean, they they've got their demons, they've got something that's driving them. Garen Thomas is um far too well adjusted and, and actually I think fairly content in, in the role that he's got and living the life that he does. You can't nod, Lionel. That's, that's not going to come across, remember? <laughs> Keep reminding him, listeners. Let's wrap it up there. That's enough for, for tonight. We'll be back again tomorrow with our nightly roundup and listen out in the morning for our morning kilometre zero uh, um, every morning around about 10 a.m. British time. About It's about a 10 to 15 minute um, little snapshot of something on the tour. It was the Aero Trains this morning. It was Domestics yesterday. What is it tomorrow, Lionel? Tomorrow, it's kind of the sound of the publicity caravan and the and the fans who went out onto the cobbles and bumped into a couple of quite interesting people. Got some good ones planned for next week. You've got your crashes yeah, one yeah, coming up. Yeah, right? yeah. It's, it's going to be cracking. Excellent. Right, well, listen, thanks, chaps. Thanks very much, Daniel. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Thanks, Lionel. Thank you, Richard. During the Tour de France, listen twice a day to the Telegraph Cycling Podcast, supported by Jaguar. There is all the latest interviews and analysis from every stage in the evening show. And in the morning... Monday to Friday, Kilometer Zero will take you inside the tour in the company of the podcast team, Richard Moore, Daniel Freib and Lionel Burney. 